Coming up on Dr. Kiki Science Hour, we're talking about taking science to new levels with Zach Ronenberg from Da Vinci High School, science teacher and KSTF fellow. Up next on Dr. Kiki Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode number 35 for Monday, March 1st, 2010. Making Science Matter. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com forward slash kiki. Welcome, everybody, to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki, and joining me on the show today is Zach Ronenberg. He is a science teacher at Da Vinci High School in Davis, California. And today we are going to be talking about the fun that you can have making science matter. Now, Zach is an interesting interesting guy. He he spent much of his childhood, I've taken all of this from a bio page that um, KSTF uh, Teaching Fellowship set up for Zach. So um, Zach spent much of his childhood in his father's shop tinkering and building things from spare parts. So you're, he's a tinkerer. We like that. Including an air-powered cannon that could shoot an apple over 500 feet. That's a fun project. Your love of physics came alive in high school, and he discovered a passion for teaching while studying physics at the University of California, San Diego. After earning his MA in education from UC Berkeley, Zach's student taught for a while and ended up teaching physics and earth science at Skyline High School in Oakland. He's taught in Oakland, San Mateo, and Davis, and now he's working on incorporating project-based learning on a large scale, and this year, working... As, as a science teacher in physics and chemistry at Da Vinci High School, he is responsible for creating and implementing what is called 100% project-based uh, physics and chemistry curriculums, which I think is really interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what, how that's different from another kind, other kinds of science curriculums? So... I guess the main difference is that all of the content that I'm teaching comes through the form of a project, as the title would would uh, lead you to believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, the the idea is that if kids can put science in a context that matters to them and has some relevance to the real world, that it won't seem like sort of this nebulous list of facts that they need to to memorize or equations that they just need to plug numbers into that it will seem a lot more real to them um, and hopefully get them a lot more interested and make more sense and understand it better um, and have new ways of of showing their understanding. So that's sort of the idea behind project-based learning in general is that um, it's, it's a lot more real to kids and gets a lot more kids engaged in learning rather than just trying to get a grade. So with with the project based learning, we're talking about having the kids really get hands on. They're getting what could be considered just experiential learning ex- experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it, there. There's a couple of components to it. It's it's very. So depending on the project, it could be very kind of real world based. Like for instance, the the project that I'm running with my physics classes right now um, is they're they're learning to do energy audits on their own home. So we're learning about efficiency and power transmission and uh, electrical circuits. And um, rather than just having them mess around with light bulbs and batteries in the classroom, which I do do as part of the kind of the scaffolds for them to learn concepts. They also are going into their house and measuring all of the electrical devices in their house um, and seeing how much power they use 
and then trying to come up with some uh, calculation of how much power their house is using on a on sort of a daily basis and then extrapolating that out um, over a year or multiple years and right. looking at really how much energy are they using and, and what else could that energy be doing like if that were used to power someone's house in um, Eastern Europe or Nigeria, like how many houses could they power for the, the energy they're using just for their single family here in Davis. Um, so there's a lot of like kind of real world stuff where they, they look at, you know, what are they doing in their lives that, and, and how does that kind of affect the larger world? Um, and, and then there's some other projects that are more sort of just, more classroom based um, and they're, they're sort of like challenges um, that we do in the classroom that they don't have as many ties to their life at home or life, life outside of school. Yeah. So there's sort of some of both. Yeah. Um, do you, do you, have you found that, I mean, you, you've been through several different schools and several different school districts. Have you found that teaching, is it different from district to district? Are all of them happy if you want to do the project-based learning or have you found a lot of differences between the different schools? Um, I would say that as a science teacher, there's, there's a fair amount of autonomy mm -hmm. um, in terms of, of how we teach concepts. Like California sets the, the state standards that we have to follow and do certain topics. Um, but being a physics teacher, I'm usually either the only physics teacher or one of two um, at most schools, only the largest schools I've been at have had two teachers. And so um, there's some collaboration, but I, mm -hmm. I have a lot of autonomy in how I teach. And most schools um, are pretty open to kind of letting me try things. Um, That's good. The, the current school that I'm at is a, is this, the whole school is project based. Um, and so they are, they've given me basically kind of open range to say, you know, try things. If they don't work, that's okay. Um, we're just trying to get the best project based program we can. Um, right. and doing that hundred percent is a lot of work. Um, I, I don't think this is my fifth year teaching. And I think my first year was probably the hardest. Um, and this, this year, has been the next artist because I'm basically reinventing everything I do this year to put it in a project context. Yeah. And, and, and is that daunting? Is it total is going from we're teaching out of a book, we're teaching, you know, this is, this is how it works, but you're going to just read this, study the text, study what I tell you in class, watch what I do. Don't do what I do to suddenly do what I do or make it up right. yourself. Right, right. It's, it's a huge change. And I would say over the five years that I've been teaching, I've kind of, I've incrementally gone towards more and more project based. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of, I, I think I like it because it's how I learn. Um, right. And, but, and there, there is still some like traditional kind of methodology in there. Like you don't, there's lots of good stuff with traditional teaching that you keep doing. Um, like in the context of, of learning how to do an energy audit, we still do a lot of this of similar labs that we would have done in a normal physics classroom. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the end outcome is this really meaningful thing that kids know how to do at the end, rather than just like, oh, neat, I know these 10 physics concepts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where do you get your, your inspiration for the different projects that we're going to get to each of the projects a little bit later, but where, do, where does the inspiration come from? Um, I would say that, that some of it comes from my background. Um, I grew up, my father was a, was a contractor. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up sort of just building stuff in his shop and messing around and figuring out how things work. And, um, and so one of the projects that I've done is have, have kids build like a scale model of a house and then wire it with switches and lights. Um, and, and that came from just my experience kind of learning how to do the electrical on a house and thinking, wow, I, I learned a lot in that process. And, and I'd love to share that with my students. Um, and then other, other project ideas come from other science teachers. I, I'm in this group 
uh, the Noel Science Teaching Foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's in my cohort, there's four other physics teachers. And so a lot of the projects I've worked on come from sort of these late night brainstorming sessions where we get together and are, are like, you know, we'd really love to build instruments in class. Like how, how would we do that? Or we'd love to, um, I think, uh, use stop motion animation. Um, and, and so we have some crazy idea and then figure out how it's going to work, uh, within the context of our, of our classes. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about the, this group, the Knowles, uh, teaching foundation and how, I mean, it's got to be fabulous to have access to that kind of a group of people who just want to be creative and try something new. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, like I was saying, being a physics teacher, there's usually either no other physics teachers or one other physics teacher at the school. And you don't necessarily have a lot of time to, to collaborate in a, in their sort of normal busy day. So being part of KSTF um, and having these other science teaching fellows um, is, is really kind of one of the most amazing resources I've gotten in my teaching career. Um, we meet three times a year and we have conferences kind of all over the U.S. because the teachers in it are from all over the U.S. And we, we meet for three days and we just sit down and, and either hash out new ideas or we bring in um, video or student work from, from lessons we've created in the past and figure out, okay, what are kids learning? What are they not learning? How can we make them learn it better? Um, and we really try to focus hard on like both honing our, our skills as an instructor, but also figuring out what kids learn and how they learn and how we can help them do that better. Yeah. It seems, it seems like that would be just a, a fabulous uh, group of people to be able to access. And I, I think that would be one of the benefits. Do you know how people could, how, how did you find about, find out about it? And then how can other people, other teachers who might be interested in it, find out more about it? Um, so I found out about it through a colleague uh, when I was, at, when I was at Berkeley, um, one of the students, the other students in my teaching credential program uh, had joined KSDF the year before me and had told me about it and said, wow, this is a really amazing program. You really got to apply. It's, it's, it's really like nothing else out there because there, there's no other groups of strictly science teachers that have the kind of support that they do. Um, and so I found out about it through, through my friend now Bradford, who uh, we went to grad school together and now he lives up in Portland, but we mm-hmm. still talk all the time. And, um, and so then I applied and got in the next year. Um, and it's, it's a pretty rigorous application process. Like you uh, fill out the application and you get letters of rec and then you have a phone interview and then you go for an in-person interview and it's, and it's really the best science teachers in the United States um, are selected. And so it's, um, it's really cool group of people because I've I've never been around a group of people that inspiring and that into doing what they do. Um, Yeah. Do you have, have you found, is it, do you think that you're having influences outside of your group? So you, you've met this group of people through the Knowles science teaching fellowship and you know, it's wonderful to be able to access them, access these people and be creative and come up with new ideas and, and work on stuff. Do you think it's spreading out from there? So have you become points of, from which to spread these new ideas and ways to teach? Um, I think yes. And, and it's, I think it's taken a while for, for sort of KSTF to, to get some recognition on a national scale. Um, there's, there's a lot of recognition of programs like Teach for America mm-hmm. um, yeah. or there, there's a few other ones that, that are similar. But what those really focus on is getting career changers, getting people who are, um, you know, engineers or lawyers or whatever coming into and teaching for two years. And then really having no commitment to teaching after that, just going, oh, we'll get you to teach for two years. And KSDF is really focused on the long term and getting teachers to stay in the profession. Yeah. And so I think now about we're, we're five or six years into it and 
there's getting to be sort of that critical number of teachers out there where, and they're getting to the point in their career where they're sort of the head of the departments now or leaders in their school and are influencing other teachers at their schools and, and outside of their schools to try uh, some mm -hmm. of the things that we do in KSTF. Um, and there's, I've heard actually from a lot of different KSTF folks that they have gotten their other science teachers to try inquiry based labs mm -hmm. or um, worked with them on rewriting um, some of their curriculum or they're now leading professional development in their own schools. So I think, yeah, KSTF is, is just starting to have a much bigger effect um, on the world outside of our little conferences. I think that's I think that's really good. Do you find I mean, there's there's a lot of discussion about the state of education in in America and our failing schools and there there's generally kind of a, a ne just a negative feeling that at least in conversations I've had where I've just talked with people about what's going on in our schools. Do you think that um, with programs like this and seeing that the ideas are kind of getting fostered and, and pushed out to to other um, to other places, other people. Um, do you think that that the sciences maybe have a little bit uh, a better place now, or I mean, do you have any, any any opinion on that? It's I don't know. It's hard to say because I think there's still a sort of a general view that science, especially physics, is is sort of this thing that only a small portion of uh, of high school students do that it's um, sort of seen as really hard and that you have to have lots of math background to be able to be successful and so wh while it is a very challenging thing to learn i don't think it's beyond um, the scope of most students to be able to be successful in physics or chemistry or biology or um, any science but i feel like there's still sort of that perception um, in schools and i've talked yeah. to counselors about it and they're saying oh yeah i don't i'm not going to encourage kids to take physics and i'm like no no i want i want a bigger cross section because right now the kids who sign up for science are sort of that the small group of kids who are already interested in it right so there's there's a pre-selected group of people who the kids who are kind of interested in it they want to sign up for it they want to do it one of the things about da vinci high school they didn't have a science program before they, they weren't right. teaching science at all before you started, before you came in, right? Right. Um, Which I find they, just uh, amazing. <laughs> like, how, how well, can you have a school without science? <laughs> <laughs> they, they did. Their students took science, um, but the way that it worked um, was that Da Vinci started as their charter school, or we're a charter school, mm -hmm. and they started kind of as a satellite to Davis High School, and they were sort of in this corner in a, in a bunch of portables off the corner of davis high and so and and they offered math and humanities so uh history english math and video and film um and so any other electives the kids would go over to davis high and take their classes over at davis high and what i started hearing from from my da vinci students was when I would do projects um, at Davis High and I'd have maybe six or seven Da Vinci kids in my class, they'd be like, oh man, you should, you should come to Da Vinci. You should come teach here. You, you're just like a Da Vinci teacher. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, that'd be excellent if you guys offered science. Um, but when I was teaching at Davis High, they didn't. And um, when, I, when I had actually first moved to Davis, I had called the principal of Da Vinci and said, hey, I, you know, I heard about your school. I'm really, really interested in teaching there, and I'd, I'd love to teach at, in this project-based environment. And um, and he was like, "Yeah, we'd love to have you, but we don't offer science right now." And then this uh, this last year, Da Vinci moved to a new site, and we have more space now, and we changed the the way that the charter is structured, so we're an all-inclusive mm -hmm. high school rather than just the humanities and math. Um, so now we have the funds and we have the space to offer our own science program and uh, PE and uh, foreign languages and some other electives. A lot of things to actually allow students to become well-rounded <laughs> human yeah. beings. Yeah. <laughs> and to do it all in this project-based context where the students who select to go there for whatever reason have 
have decided that that's the way that they want to learn. And mm -hmm. some go because every kid gets a laptop and they really like the technology base for it. Right. Some kids go because they like the social aspects of working in groups and they um, like the, the ability to be creative and try out kind of these weird things that Da Vinci teachers let them do. Right. Uh, as opposed to just filling out worksheets. Yeah, it sounds it's it sounds like a really neat model. I do you know if this kind of a, a model of school is is multiplying? Are these I mean Davis is a pretty special place. There's a you know, it's a university town. There are a bunch of it's it's there are a bunch of professors who live there in the local community. It's it's very well educated. There's funding um, right, because right. there is there is money in the community, housing values are high because of the university, you know. So there are a lot of things that go into allowing a place like Davis to have a school like Da Vinci High. Um, you know, is this something that could be implemented, or is it being implemented in other outer areas or other areas of the country, even? Yes, actually, um, Da Vinci is part of a network of schools called the New Tech Network, mm -hmm. um, and it was started in Napa. Um, I'm not sure how long ago, probably within the last 10 years or so. Um, and that model uh, has been spreading across the country. And now there's kind of schools all over the country. I think California still has the most, but they, there's some in Oregon, there's some in New Mexico, there's some in, I think, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I might be wrong about this. I might have the state wrong. But I think, I think New Jersey is going all project-based. Their, okay. their entire public school system is going to go all, so the, the entire state yes that wow. they're adopting this model as a, a educational reform model that they're going to try to implement across the state i wonder how that works with local school boards and everybody kind of agreeing to that that's got yeah. it <laughs> that's going to be a big deal yeah and I, I probably have the state wrong or something but but i know they're, they're yeah. yeah that it's it is expanding and it's i think it's finally being seen as a sort of legitimate way of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there was, there was sort of a swing for a while towards the fundamentals, towards, you know, the three R's and, and just drill and kill. Um, and I feel like right now there's sort of the swing back towards doing things that, that are a little more um, creative and allow kids to kind of, Create, do their own, um, I'll find the right term right now. But, but allow, the, allow the kids like self-discovery, be able to find their own projects, be able to, to learn at their, in, in a way that, uh, that they find really interesting. Yeah. 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 And, and that there's these, this kind of idea called 21st century skills that, um, a bunch of businesses have gotten together, um, and said, here are the kind of the qualities we look for in um in, in our new hires yeah right and none of them have to do with performing well on standardized tests or being able to fill out worksheets they're all about creativity and collaboration and knowing about being technologically literate um huh. and so all those things are the the things that we're shooting for in our in our curriculum not only to get the content, but also to get these 21st century skills. Right. And on that note, I have to take a quick break for our sponsor, a word from audible.com. Thank you to audible.com for sponsoring this hour of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. And for anyone who is watching the show now, listening to the show as a podcast, Audible is giving you a special offer for a free audiobook, if you want to try out their service, you can get one free audiobook from their over 60,000 titles of so many different genres. It's, it's just amazing. So if you are interested in your free audiobook, you can visit www.audiblepodcast.com forward slash Kiki. K-I-K-I. -K -I. That's audiblepodcast.com forward slash Kiki. And you can get a sciencey book. You can get a techie book. You can get a business book. You can download something that's escapist and will get you away from this world that we live in for just a few hours. Um, and it's read to you. You don't have to turn any pages. All you have to do is listen. These books come in very handy for people who have long commutes or if you are heading out traveling. And for anyone interested, uh, This Week in Science has a book club. And so I'm going to suggest as this week's book 
the earth after us. What legacy will humans leave in the rocks? It's by Jan Zalesiewicz. I cannot pronounce his name. I'm very, I apologize for that. But the earth after us, what legacy will humans leave in the rocks? And this book uh, is a, is a fascinating uh, geological, uh, geological story. It's scientifically supported uh, investigation of what would happen if humans disappeared from the earth, earth and what would happen to everything uh, that we've created and where would it be left behind? So to download this audio book for free, if you want to try out the Audible podcast service, you can just go to audiblepodcast.com forward slash Kiki. And, um, and that's it for this Audible sponsor message. I would like uh, also to... Re, to let you know again, we this is Dr. Kiki Science Hour that you're listening to, and we are speaking with Zach Roneberg, and he is a science teacher at Da Vinci High School in Dav- Davis, where they do where he's working on project based learning, and we've been talking a lot about the schools and what, but the philosophy that that, un, that comes behind this project based learning. But let's get down to the projects. I'm excited to hear about all of the projects that you've been working on. You mentioned at the beginning of the show, the energy project that your students are working on. So if you could give us a little bit more information about, you know, what's happening with that and how, and how, how do they measure the energy? How do they know how efficient they're being or not efficient? What do they do? Right. So um, the, the big idea behind the project is that uh, the kids are going to try to go home and, and figure out how much energy they're using. And then, uh, the product that they're creating. So most projects have some sort of end product or presentation. Uh, so they'll be creating this public service announcement that's aimed at some target group that they've chosen um, about methods of being more energy efficient. Um, and they'll be using some of the information they get from their own houses to do that. So to go and uh, to to do the audit on their own house, they're uh, we're paired with the UC Davis Energy Efficiency Group, um, and they came in and did two sessions with my classes and uh, taught them how to do an energy audit. And we, we looked at some things in the classroom and how much energy they use. And we have these little, um, these little boxes that are maybe that big or so. <laughs> um, and, and they're called a, a kilowatt and you plug them into the wall and then anything you plug into the kilowatt it will measure how much energy is being used um, and you can look at uh, real basically you can look at the, the number of watts being used and you can set a timer and and take in uh, a number of kilowatt hours um, that the which is an amount of energy that the um, the device would use or you can program in how much electricity costs and it'll tell you how much it would cost to run this device for a certain amount of time. Um, and then they take that information and put it into a spreadsheet and, and do some calculations with um, estimating how many hours a day they use each device and come out with some uh, total amount of energy use. And, and it's kind of surprising sometimes what they find where things like, like you wouldn't expect, like your, your TiVo box, that sits there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, draws a significant amount of power. And, um, and there's really no way to get around that because it has to be on all the time. And there's very little competition in the market to make a lower power consumption one because there's only Mm -hmm. a few major players who make these things. So there's actually, um, some legislation right now about making set top boxes be lower energy users because they're such uh, huge consumers right now, which yeah. surprised me. Yeah, that is surprising. I don't, I don't know that a lot of people actually would be aware of that at all. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so yeah. And they take all this information and they mm-hmm. make uh, this PSA. And then um, next week, actually we'll be having presentations in the classroom and we'll have folks from the uh, Davis uh, energy efficiency group will come in and the uh, local newspaper is going to cover it and um, some parents come in and so we'll, then we'll have this big panel that the students will have to present their PSA to the panel and it's it's almost like a thesis defense like yeah. it's not not that huge obviously but they have to um, 
present their work and then field questions from the panel. And it, it really gets pretty intense sometimes when, when there's experts there and they're asking questions sort of on this expert level because yeah. the, kids, the kids are so good at presenting now that they sometimes seem like experts and, and the people on the panel sort of forget that they're dealing with high school kids. Uh, and so sometimes <laughs> that's, that's a good like, thing oh, in some ways. Yeah. 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 It's impressive that kids can, can sort of come off like that as, as an expert in their topic. That's, that's awesome. And I think I'm sure though, that the, the research that they do to prepare for the presentation, that they actually do a really thorough job and they probably do know the area fairly well in a very focused way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they generally know their, their topics very well. It's when, it's when you start asking them, okay, well, how does this, you know, relate to coal fired power plants mm -hmm. or nuclear power plants? And they're like, well, we didn't I, quite study that yet. <laughs> I haven't gotten to graduate school yet. Hold on a couple yeah. of years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, so, so this, that's one, it's very relevant immediately. Uh, the students have an idea immediately of their impact, like what energy they're using, the efficiency of the devices that they're using. Um, you know, this, it's very, very immediately relevant to their lives, which I think is, that's one of the most interesting aspects of it. Um, Others, what, what's another project that you're doing? Your biodiesel bio project seems pretty, I mean, along the energy spectrum, this is a pretty cool project as well. Yeah, that, this one, actually both these projects are ones that I just um, have started doing this year. And so they're still kind of in their infancy in terms of figuring out all the details. But right now, my chem classes are involved in making biodiesel and uh, basically one of the other teachers, the other science teacher at my school has a, has a v, uh, VW Jetta that runs on vegetable oil. Uh -huh. And so she goes, and she said, those. I'd like your students to make me some, some fuel. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually I, I kind of proposed, I was like, well, if we make some biodiesel, would you be willing to put it in your car? And she's like, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> and so we basically started out with the students researching the feasibility of, of, they're basically they're going to make a proposal to the Davis City Council at the end of this about the feasibility of running the the Davis fleet of diesel vehicles on biodiesel. Wow! And so to understand whether or not that's feasible, I wanted to get them involved in actually making biodiesel and learning sort of fundamental chemistry concepts through um, the process of doing that. And yeah. it's actually kind of surprised me how many different chemistry concepts come up in the process of making uh, this biodiesel that you look at density, um, you get into polarity and non-polarity, you do moles and molar mass and stoichiometry and uh, heat of reaction. Like mm -hmm. tomorrow we're going to be taking our biodiesel samples and burning them and doing some calorimetry and seeing how much energy comes out of the biodiesel versus nice. straight vegetable oil. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's sort of one of those things where I feel like I jumped down a rabbit hole and I, I just keep <laughs> How much? finding all these new things that fit in with this biodiesel project and it's kind of exciting. How far yeah, how far can you go? And so the students, are they working within within the class just for this one year or do you have students for multiple years? So say with this biodiesel project, are they just going to work on it for a few months and, that, and that's it? Or is this something that they can keep doing for a longer period of time, or do you just keep bringing in new people and teaching it over again? Right now, the model is sort of a, a standard high school class model where it's mm -hmm. year long and we do more or less the same projects each year. Mm -hmm. And each time a new class comes in, you, you do the, the same or slightly different versions of the same projects. Um, but I do have uh, some friends. Uh, one guy lives in Indiana and he has started doing biodiesel in his class and the kids got so into it that they formed sort of like a biodiesel co-op wow. and made a reactor, a biodiesel reactor out of an old water heater. Um, and their school now takes their, the, the waste from their cafeteria, the waste oil nice. and makes biodiesel. And then I don't think it's legal to sell, but if you form a co-op, then the mm -hmm. co-op members can use They, they the can product. use it. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I would love to get something like that going, but it's because our science program is still totally in its infancy. I have no idea what 
sort of where those things are going to go. Right. And you'll to do something like that, you'll need a group of students who are really dedicated to it. I mean, that's the kind of thing that takes dedication. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you got to keep it up. So and, you, and it's oh, go ahead. just that, that it's hard as a teacher to have the time after school to to make that happen. So you really have to have one or two kids that are really gung ho mm -hmm. and they'll take on a lot of the organization. Um, but there are things like that at our school where we like, we started up this, this bike co-op where the kids, they go to Da Vinci. Some of them also take classes at Davis high. And so they needed a way of getting back and forth between Davis high and Da Vinci now that mm -hmm. we're separate. And so we started this bike co-op and there's a few kids who have sort of kept this thing running where they fix up bikes and kids can check them out to ride over to Davis high. And, um, so I think at this particular school, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for kids to become leaders and things like that. Yeah. A lot of motivation too. So with the, the biodiesel project, you said they're going to be uh, presenting on feasibility of biodiesel. Um, what are the findings? Do you, do you have any preliminary findings? Um, Right now, it looks like most groups are coming up with sort of similar conclusions that it's feasible. Um, there's minimal engine modifications that mm -hmm. need to be done, uh, mostly just that biodiesel can rot out rubber hoses. So if you have any rubber hoses, those need to be switched to some other kind of newer uh, material. Yeah. Um, and then finding a source. So part of the proposal might be we're going to buy this biodiesel from some producer in Sacramento, or it might include something for, we're going to try to start up a local production and gather waste oil from all the restaurants in Davis and see how much we can make in Davis. So I think there's kids sort of going both directions with it's, it's much more feasible to just go buy it versus, mm -hmm. Hey, we should actually try to make some of this. Right. All right. Let's move on to another project. What, it, what do you, what do you think is your, what is your favorite project that you're working on right now? Um, I would say my favorite project is uh, the America's Next Top Science Rockers, which yes. has a, a, an intendedly cheesy name. Um, <laughs> I like it though. <laughs> it's sort of meant to, to be a spoof on, on reality shows. And the, the, the premise is that you're going to be trying out for this new reality show where science students build their own instruments and uh, basically design, build, and play their own instruments within the context of a band um, and perform for the class. And then um, they both have to have some expertise in talking about how their instrument works and how it was built, as well as um, be able to play it and be able to play a song well with the other band members. So they have to be in tune and there's, there's all kinds of challenges to making an instrument be in tune with uh, the yeah. other groups. Yeah. And you have, we have a bunch of, uh, of pictures that you've, that you've um, passed along to me here and there's, let me see if I can bring some of these up. Oh. And it's redirecting to Picasso. There we are. <laughs> Slideshow. Um, let's see. I'll bring, see if I can bring these up. So we've got, there's somebody who made their, he, did he make his own guitar there? Yeah, he yeah. built uh, this amazing electric guitar that sort of just blew me away and, and built the entire thing from scratch. Wow. So, you, so the kids, the, the, what are they doing there? Were they, were they measuring some kind of electrical um, capacitance so, or something? Is there an electrical component in this? Uh, there are some kids who choose to build electrical, uh, electric instruments, uh, like an electric guitar or an electric bass. Um, most of them are, are not electric, and, but what they're doing there is uh, we have microphones hooked up to the, the computers in class, and they can use the microphone to measure the frequencies that their instrument is producing and then use that to help tune their instruments and figure out what harmonics are being produced and overtones. And so it really gets kind of complex where they'll, they'll get really into looking at the not just like the main frequency that they're I like that banjo <laughs> yeah that, <laughs> um, yeah that there, there's it, it kind of blows me away the variety of instruments that kids make and some of the creativity and I, it, kid, it, is it completely up to them what instrument they decide they're going to make so i give them sort of like broad categories of instruments that they might be interested in 
Um, so strings, percussion, and um, wind instruments are sort of the, the categories, but within that, they can pretty much design their instrument however they want. I think that I think that's that allows a lot of flexibility. And then at the same time, they get to learn about the principles that underlie um, harmonics or um, wind, wind instruments versus string instruments versus like, how do these things work? So you act, do you actually sit down and have in class discussions? Do they I mean, is it just they present how their instrument works at the end of it? So uh, it's, it's about a month long project. And the first two weeks they learn uh, mostly through labs and some discussion, um, they learn a lot of sort of basic wave principles and learn about standing waves and traveling waves and transverse and longitudinal waves. And, and then once they get to actually building the instrument, they then have to take those concepts and say, okay, well, how does that, um, how does that play into my particular type of instrument? Um, so it's, so it's a little bit of traditional teaching, uh, in combination with, a little bit of wood shop and a little bit of engineering and some um, sort of some design challenges. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of amazing that that kid right there is on the, was on the screen, yeah. built a, a saw, um, you know, like a kind of traditional Southern, like, right. The, the saw. saw. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and his challenge was that he, one of the requirements is you can't play it by ear. You have to, have specific notes so that anyone could play it. So he had to find a way of calibrating his saw wow. where if you put it at a certain position, it will make a certain note. And so that was um, a huge challenge actually. Yeah. Um, and he figured out some like basically that if you, which I have here, um, <laughs> but if you, if you turn the handle a certain amount, it will, for every few degrees will change its note by a half tone or a full tone right. and then laid out a scale and was able to basically label all the notes on it. And it actually sounded pretty good. That's so fun. You had, and there's a video, the video that you sent me, can we play this of the, of, yeah. the, of, of the kids? Um, so this is a video of the kids. Let me turn up the, uh, the MacBook so we actually get the volume, but um, some of the kids performing, uh, what's the song they're performing? Uh, it's Crazy Train. Crazy Train on instruments that they created themselves. This is just yes. this is just great. Wow. Okay, well, I'm not ready. Wait, I have a question. Do you guys wear black on purpose? <laughs> no, no, no. We're just emo. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have to start with Jordan. Okay. Jordan, you're the first one. A little bit of stage well, fright. I've been chosen yeah. to do the most embarrassing parts. So, ready? <laughs> ready? All aboard! the best part <laughs> his his instrument was backwards
That is so great. And so, yeah, they, oh, go ahead. They, they had an amazing time with that. And they spent a lot of time working on their instruments, but it came out so good, and they were so proud of it that it was totally worth it. I'm really impressed that the that the guitar was completely homemade. I mean, yeah. The, that it sounded great. I mean, he was a good guitar player to begin with, but then the guitar sounded great, completely homemade. And yeah, yeah, it, was, yeah, it kind of it, it still blows my mind that he was able to do that. I don't know how much time he spent, but it was a lot. Yeah. So did you have um, I mean, are they now going on a, a YouTube world tour or something? <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Yeah. yeah. The, the kid who had his his uh, xylophone backwards, he said, so I, I did the video and put it on YouTube and um, he said that kids around school that he didn't even know were coming up to him and just like putting their hands out like this and then doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it does matter in, a, in something like a, a xylophone to get your get your notes right. Yes. Which direction yes. it, you have it facing? <laughs> yeah, that I think that's a one. That's a wonderful project. Like you said, there are so many different um, different uh, different things that come in. Different principles of physics that go into creating the instruments themselves. Um, another project that sounds like a lot of fun that you do is the, the egg drop, but it's every, everyone growing up does an egg drop. You, you yeah. try and protect your egg in a milk carton and yeah. drop it off the top of a building and keep it from, from splatting on this, on the pavement below. Right. Right. But yours is different. Yeah. And my issue, I, I have nothing against the traditional egg drop and, and I, I've done it many times and I, you know, it's a fun thing, but the problem with it, as I see, is that kids build some neat device and then they drop it off the roof and then you ask them, what'd you learn? And they go, um, padding helps eggs not break. Right. Or, uh, I learned that my machine didn't work. Um, <laughs> and, and unfortunately that's often the limit of sort of what they get out of that um and maybe a little bit of engineering and problem solving um so what i do is i have instead of them building a device they have to build a bungee cord that will get the egg as close to the ground as possible without actually hitting the ground so they basically have to they have to solve a problem um that is how much gravitational energy does the egg have when they when it gets dropped and how much will, the, will their bungee have to stretch in order to absorb all that energy? And then they have to write a, um, basically a, not really a software program, but I call it software. Mm -hmm. They basically have to make an Excel spreadsheet that has formulas in it and inputs and outputs that will, um, because I, I don't tell them the drop height until mm -hmm. the day of the drop. And so they have to test their bungee and they know uh, kind of how stiff it is and they can calculate how much energy it will, it will absorb for how much stretch um, it stretches. And then on the day of, I give them an egg and I tell them how high it is and they have to plug all that information into their Excel spreadsheet yeah. and their spreadsheet should all do all the math for them if they programmed it right. And then they actually go outside and test it and the closer they get to the ground, the better their grade is. Uh, <laughs> the closer they get without actually touching the ground. And this is important. Right. I mean, bungee jumping is something people do for fun now. And so this is these are the basic calculations that people who are putting together these bungee jump uh, devices, these bungee jump de uh, events, they have mm -hmm. to figure out how, how strong the bungee has to be. They have to figure out how, how many bungees they have to figure out, you know, use the height, the weight, the like all these different parameters. Right. Right to actually keep people safe. Right. And, and the kids, um, it's surprising how well they can, um, actually tune their bungee. And, and I get kids within five or 10 centimeters of the ground, um, on a, on a pretty consistent basis because they've done such careful measurements of their bungee that they know exactly how far it's going to stretch. So we have some images here from one of your egg drop adventures. Your who who climbs the ladder? Is that you? For no, I have the kids go up the ladder. Um, <laughs> of course, you have to clear that with the principal first. But right. one, one kid from each team climbs the ladder and hooks up their egg to there's there's like a, a carabiner up at the top that they hook up their egg to, and and then they drop it. And we have a high speed camera um, that catches the whole thing. So if there's any dispute about how close it got to the ground, we have the high speed camera um, to 
to check it out. And then it's also just fun to watch the high speed at the end. Yeah, I love this picture. Yeah. <laughs> so concerned about what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she was very concerned. The uh, So the high-speed camera, that's another thing in terms of tools that science science teachers can use, that technology allowing uh, advancements in projects in the classroom. Uh-huh. This Having a high-speed camera is something that would probably come in handy. And I mean, this is one one way it would come in handy, but I'm sure it comes in handy all sorts of places. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a pretty cool tool. It's kind of gotten this cult following with physics teachers because you can capture um, things that, that you know would normally kids wouldn't be able to see, like things exploding yeah. or uh, ripples of milk drops in a in a bowl of milk, and seeing the waveforms actually move and capturing that at three hundred frames a second or twelve hundred frames a second um, allows kids to analyze things they they never have in the past, which is very cool. Yeah. So do you do, so do you, do you personally do a lot of the high speed photography? Um, I just got the camera this year. Um, like I love my principal. He was gracious enough to give me a thousand dollars to buy this camera. Wow. Um, and it's a, it's a Casio EX F1. I just saw in the chat that someone was asking about that. What, what can, what is the camera that you're using? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so I haven't done a ton with it, but I've had kids like bring in their paintball guns and we've taken video of, of paintballs being shot and exploding and bow and arrows, uh, like an arrow exploding a, uh, a water balloon and, a, and a, um, just hitting a target and kind of seeing the, uh, the waves travel through the arrow after it hits and seeing how it reacts to um, the forces of impact and stuff. Um, so there's some cool stuff we've done. Yeah, it's how it's, it sounds really neat. The, the other things that you've done, um, Rube Goldberg machines. Do, do you have the mm-hmm. students design and build their own, their own Rube Goldberg yeah. machines? Yeah, and and kids love that project. They um, does it take over your classroom? It that project actually they build it at home because okay. if I let them build it in the classroom, it would completely take over. Yeah. Um, and then we they, they bring the machines in and they have what I what I call a a, a trade show basically where they have to like hawk their machine to the rest of the crowd and try to convince them that it's the best machine. And, and then at the end of it, each kid gets some stocks and they get to invest in their favorite machine. And so they're sort of like a crowd favorite in terms of, um, you know, which one had the most style or which one had the coolest energy transitions or something. Right. Which one everybody wants to invest in. That's the one. Yeah. That's the yeah, one. Yeah. Um, and here we've got, let me open up this link. There are some pictures of uh, creating a rideable hovercraft. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a, an interesting project. What kind of yeah. what what principles of, of physics does that does that cover? Um, this project actually wasn't um, wasn't an in class project. It was for a competition that was put on by Intel and okay. the Sacramento Kings. Okay, and so it was sort of a project to inspire young engineers to get involved in, in building some device. And the the purpose of the device was to increase crowd participation at a Kings game. Uh, and so a bunch of Sacramento area schools all built devices and, and ours was this hovercraft. And the idea was that the Kings mascot was supposed to ride around on the hovercraft and it was like his floating, um, floating throne kind of. And um, the, there is a lot of physics involved with it, but the, that particular project was more just uh, built for the engineering aspects and we didn't think a okay. whole lot about the um, the physics involved because it was more for this competition, right? It look so did did the kids really really seem to get involved in it and enjoy the the project process? Yeah, they they had a blast, and I I had a really hard time keeping my hands off of it because I there was some points where I was like, oh, I just want to get in there and like right. you know put in some screws or whatever, and I, I can and fix I, this. It'll be really good. Yeah. But I, I was really adamant that I was like, this is your project and here's all my tools. And I you know, brought all my woodworking tools from home and said, taught them how to use things safely and said, you know, go for it. It's, it's your baby. And they got up to the whiteboard and started drawing plans and were, you know, discussing whether we needed two lift fans or one lift fan and uh, how to like how big to make the holes on the bottom of the mm-hmm. of the skirt in order to have optimal airflow. And so there's a lot of cool conversations coming out of it. Yeah. And I'm sure they learned a lot in the process, just the, the whole the whole thing to get, putting it all together. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
Wow, this is, I'm, I'm just looking at this list of stuff. It just seems to go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> this is one, one fun thing after another. Now, okay, this, this one that I'm, that I'm going to bring up right now, um, this is something that you did and not the kids. Yes. Um, so another one of my sort of fun little hobbies is building neat demonstration devices. Yeah. So a couple of summers ago, a, a, a couple of physics teachers and myself all built these beds of nails. And so I lay on the bed of nails and then I have another teacher or some students put another bed on top of me. And then a teacher comes and breaks a cement block on top of the, on top of the bed of nails. And the kids just freak out. They love it. And, um, I imagine there's a lot of no way going yeah, on. Yeah. Like, are you kidding? <laughs> and they all want to like feel the nails and see if they're really sharp. Right. And, uh, and what we end up doing is basically calculating the amount of force per nail head given, and they have to come up and like measure the area of the nail head and figure mm-hmm. out what my weight is. And um, so there's some, some cool ideas that come out of that, but it's also just sort of fun to do like the, whoa, holy cow, kind of demonstrations in class sometimes. Yeah, have you ever done hot coals, walked on hot coals for your class? Every year I have kids ask about that, Mm -hmm. and I'm always like, "Mm, I don't know, maybe (laughs) next year, we'll see. (laughs) Um, Really, you'll be fine, just walk fast. (laughs) I've seen physics teachers do it while they're like clutching a physics book and claiming that the power of physics will save them and they won't get burned, as long as they're holding their physics book. Good. That's good. Yeah, I think I think d- demonstrations like this are are good in in terms of teachability, but also in terms of the myth busting aspect. So teaching kids um, not just the principles. Okay, we can figure out how much force per nail head, but actually being able to figure out the the scientific process and that when you see things, what you see is not necessarily what is actually you know you shouldn't believe what you see. Right, right. And that, and that you, you can actually work backwards and figure out what's going on using principles of science. Yeah, yeah. And that if you see something that doesn't seem right, either someone is doing something to trick you that you're not seeing, or you just need to look into it a little bit deeper and say, well, what physics principles are at work here? And, and if this is really happening, then there must be some physics principle to explain it. Right. Yeah and, yeah, and try and get them to figure out what what might be what try and get them to work on it and figure out what might be at play. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, well, this this looks like it just looks like so much fun. I want I want to go back and take physics again. <laughs> <laughs> like, can I go back to high school? This looks like fun. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome. Like my job, I get to like go into the classroom and and do fun stuff most days. So it's um, there's a lot of other stuff that isn't, you know, I, I'm not a huge fan of grading papers and stuff, but for the most part, my job is awesome. And I, I really enjoy doing it every day. Yeah. And that's, I think that's all we can ask for is something that we enjoy doing every day. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been really fun. And I just want to say thank you so much for sharing all of the, the projects that you, uh, that you do. The one thing that we haven't gotten to yet, I completely, I almost forgot about it. Your Wiimote. Oh yeah, yeah. Your Wiimote. If you this, I I just want to get to this really quickly because this, <laughs> in terms of using interesting technology, like fun technology, and trying to create something that would normally cost a lot of money, but using more affordable supplies to be able to create something that you can use in the classroom. This, I think, this goes a long way towards that. So, if you could tell us what you did with your Wiimote. Yeah, I'll try to give you the the short version of it. Um, Basically, I, I'd been sort of intrigued with this idea of having a smart board um, where you basically, instead of having pens, you, you draw on the board and the computer picks up where the pen is and, and makes a computerized line instead of an ink line. Mm-hmm. Um, but those systems cost $1,000, $2,000. Um, and so then I was, I'd heard about this from another science teacher that you can basically inside of, of a Wiimote is an infrared camera. And when you move the Wii mode around, it will track what's called the, the, the Wii calls it a sensor bar, but really it's a light bar. Mm-hmm. It's basically a bar that goes in front of your TV that has two infrared camera or two infrared bulbs. And the camera in the Wii mode tracks where the bulbs are and figures out how it's moving. So you can do that backwards where if you set a Wii mode basically on top of your projector mm-hmm. or any place where it can see what your projector is projecting at, and then you make a pen 
that has a, instead of a writing tip, it has an infrared bulb, uh, an infrared LED bulb okay. in the tip, then the camera will see where the bulb is. And there's software that you can load on your computer that if you have a Bluetooth computer, um, mm -hmm. it will talk to the, to the Wiimote and the Wiimote will tell it where the bulb is. And then it works basically just like a pen where it knows where the bulb is. And when you, when you turn the bulb on, so you have a little switch on the pen to turn the bulb on and off. When you turn it on, it will then make a line that follows the end of the pen. Right. Um, and so you can write with this thing and um, you can use it as a, you, basically if you project your, your desktop up onto the screen or whatever program you're using, um, you can use it to control your computer. You can use it to do your PowerPoint. You can use it to um, do whatever normal thing you're, you do with your projector That's for the cool. most part. Yeah. Are, the, yeah. Do you, are there uh, instructions on how to put something like this together that you, that you found somewhere or did you, or do you have these yeah, I, posted um, somewhere? Um, I did a lot of searching on the internet and, and, hit a lot of dead ends. And what I tried to do was on my website, mm -hmm. um, which is ronabergscience.com. Um, there's this, uh, I kind of sort of tried to collate all the best resources for how to build mm -hmm. these things um, that I found. And it, it turns out it's really not that hard. It's about $10 of parts um, from Radio Shack. And, but then you also need the Wiimote and you need a projector and you need a computer to run the projector. But the actual, um, the actual infrared pen is, um, where, is super cheap. Where are you hiding it in here? Uh, if you go to educators on the left-hand side. Educators. Educators. There we go. Got it. And then under links. Wiimote smart board. Overview videos. Overview page. Whiteboard. Mac software. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of information there. So pen building ideas interesting this is great this is great so if anybody is interested in trying to develop their own smart board with a an infrared pen this is great yeah and there are some limitations to it it doesn't <laughs> take out the ink <laughs> yeah it it doesn't draw super smooth lines if you move your hand kind of slow because i think the resolution of the wiimote camera isn't super great mm -hmm. um but as long as you move your hand in sort of like fluid movements somewhat quickly it mm -hmm. um it works really well and it can pick up individual clicks really easily so um it does um it, controlling your computer with it actually works pretty well. Okay. But writing, writing letters and numbers is, is kind of not its strong point. But the, I'm sure there are all sorts of applications that people can come up with to uh, be creative with, with something like yeah, this. Yeah. yeah. And people have done a lot. If you, if you search YouTube, there's all kinds of videos about uh, different applications that people have found for it. So there's some cool stuff. Great. So the website is Ronneberg science r-o-n-n-e-b-e-r-g science.com yeah. and there are different uh the the teaching project ideas and then as well underneath the educators there is the link there for the we we mote that's pretty cool what yeah, it's it that's neat yeah all right so i think we've we've run about the to the end of our hour so i just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to tell us about what you're doing and um you know the work you're doing seems just really fun and creative and i hope that it's inspiring a whole new generation well at least classroom by classroom of, yeah, of inquisitive I, I, people i hope it is and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to me and having me on your show you're welcome so where can people uh, ronaberg science.com is there are there any other links that uh, would be important or if people want to get in touch with you is there any way that they should should do that um the the other links i'd, I'd say are davincihigh.net um and kstf.org if you'd like to find out more about the null science teaching foundation um and uh, there's there's uh, links to email me on my website ronaldbergscience.com great and so here's the the kstf.org website and again, is Ronneberg Science. Yeah. Yeah, this has been fun. So yeah. yeah. 
thank you very much and mm-hmm. yeah um i'm in davis every once in a while so maybe maybe i'll see you there sounds good okay. good well thank you and have a wonderful evening and this is it for dr kiki's science hour for episode 35 making science matter with zach ronenberg from da vinci high school kstf fellow um, in davis signing out i'm dr kiki 